Within the first glance, you might consider Shogun's Episode 8 to be a mere filler, but it has truly been a long while since I have witnessed such a masterful and intricate piece of storytelling on screen. Of course, Shogun has been a great show so far, but The Abyss of Life had me screaming, crying, and throwing up by the end. Every scene is subtle and skillfully layered with nuances making every moment of the episode important. If you bat an eye, you will probably miss how the long game of Toranaga is gradually revealed, even if it has cost him everything he held dear. With just two episodes left in the show, it is completely clear that Shogun is not rushing towards a mind-boggling action-packed ending. Instead, it is building up to much slower, skin-crawling form of devastation. Remember how at the end of the first episode, Rodriguez had said that every man has three hearts, one for the world to know, one to just share with his friends, and a secret one buried deep away from everyone. This seems to be the central idea of this episode because by the end it seems we've seen all three of Lord Toranaga's hearts. But has the Lord of Kanto crossed a limit in the wake of his ambitions? Without wasting another moment, let's discuss what went down in Shogun Episode 8. Before we go to our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us it means a lot. Thank you and let's begin. Lord Toranaga is visibly shaken up by his son's unfortunate death. For a while now, the sky above Japan has been consistently gray to match the unsettled and hopeless mood of our characters. But this grim atmosphere has only intensified as we notice how deeply Nagakado's death has affected everyone. Lord Yoshi Toranaga and his clan are seen riding his horse from Ajiro to Ido for his son's funeral. Meanwhile, Seki Nobutatsu's army is following them to Ido, guarding its boundaries to make sure that the daimyo does not get a chance to act smart. When John Blackthorne looks back and sees Lord Saiki's army trailing behind him, Toda Mariko explains that after 49 days of customary mourning, Toranaga will be taken to Osaka for his surrender. The Hatamoto then rides up to a weak and visibly ill Toranaga to offer his condolences, but the Lord doesn't respond. Instead, he ignores John to cross the bridge into Ito. When a confused John returns back to his place, Marika offers him a gift from Toranaga, the rudders and journal which were seized from his ship. Toranaga has now freed John and he is no longer bound by duty, which means John's head is safe as he doesn't have to surrender in Osaka with the others. In the meantime, Fuji will manage his land and house until he figures out what's next. Well, it seems like John wants to stick to his old plan given that his surviving crew is stuck in Ido, so after taking them along, he can go back to Aizu and eventually get to his ship to haul his ass out of Japan. But the Englishman has his heart stuck with Mariko who can never leave Toronaga's side out of her allegiance to him. While everyone is mourning Nagakado's untimely end on this trip, Yabushige takes a darkly humorous view marking Toronaga's son's death as an unideal form of death in his list. In the initial episodes, Yabushige's knack for getting a serotonin boost out of painful deaths was deeply explored, especially when he ordered one of John's crew members to be put to death by being boiled alive inside a cauldron. This dark kink seems to make a comeback when he asks his servant to list Nagakado's death to be lower than death by boiling, but higher than being eaten alive by dogs. On the other hand, the sun seems to be shining brighter than ever in Osaka, where we see Ishido basking in the glory of Toranaga's downfall, giving its credit to Lady Ochiba's suggestion of setting up Seiki as a ruse. However, Ochiba isn't ready to celebrate just yet, not until she has seen Toranaga's bloody head lying lifeless on the floor. After this, something shockingly weird happens as Ishido asks Ochiba to marry him, in order to further solidify their alliance. Although she does not seem very stoked about this proposal, Ochiba refrains from outright refusing, leaving Ishido confused as her response doesn't indicate she's leaning towards acceptance either. Toranaga's generals are not very happy with his decision to surrender. On the night before Nagakado's funeral, Toranaga's inner circle has gathered to mourn the late samurai, remembering his youthful antiques with sadness and a smile. As Omi, Yabushige, Buntaro, and Hiromatsu drink to his memory, they remember how Nagakado once kept his broken arm a secret for 10 days just to seem brave. When Hiromatsu mentions that Nagakado was too daring for his own good, 
Omi is the only one to state how Toranaga is dishonoring his son's death by surrendering. The next morning, we are as surprised as Yabushige to see that Toranaga could not make it to his own son's funeral as the procession leaves Ido for the cremation site. Apparently, he is too sick and sad to make a public appearance for anything. Yabushige then notices that some of Toranaga's generals are wearing their battle armor at the funeral as a statement of protest against their lord's surrender. So he asks Hiromatsu why can't they just head to Osaka armed with their guns and cannons. Hiromatsu soon breaks Yabushige's bubble revealing that he would be the only one heading to Osaka with the artillery as part of the Toronaga's terms of surrender. Yabushige is finally cornered because he clearly has no other way to weasel his head out. Plus, there is a sense of underlying restlessness, as nobody is happy with how Toronaga is dealing with a crisis at hand. Now, Toronaga hasn't been looking too hot since the very beginning of the episode. He has been persistently coughing, and that does not sound like a normal cold. It's the kind of cuff that often signifies that a character is about to knock at death's door. Given the master strategist he is, it would not be a stretch to assume that Toronaga is simply pretending to be weak and defeated for his enemies to think that they've won the game. The scene ends with Toronaga watching from the top of Ido's castle as the smoke rises from his son's cremation site. A series of intense but interesting meetings. Now, Toronaga might be sick but not sick enough to call for Mariko's help which is something we realize when Buntaro interrupts her meeting with Ochiba's sister, Lady Rin. Apparently Rin had just had Toronaga's grandchild and the Lord has not even met the baby yet. We then find out that when Rin contacted Ochiba, the latter had assured that her sister's family would be spared after Toronaga's surrender. This is when Buntaro comes in to inform Mariko of Toronaga's orders alongside making a special request. He invites Mariko to a tea ceremony, which she politely accepts. The focus of the scene then shifts to Tsuji, who watches Blackthorn struggle in the village while trying to buy firewood. When the father intervenes by asking for more firewood on the barbarian's behalf, it pisses John off and he proceeds to flex his hold over the Japanese language by properly requesting for charcoal this time. Although Tsuji praises Blackthorn's proficiency over the language, he follows it up with a sharp mockery, pointing out how it's not customary for a Hatamoto to live away from the castle unless he has been relieved of his position. John then asserts how he is free to finally gather his crew to reclaim his ship and pay a quick visit to the black ship. Tsuji then takes a gander at John's Kosode and asks if he would wear the same clothes while visiting his men after all this time. Without a word, John frowns upon Suji's obvious implication and leaves. The scene then shifts to the next important meeting as a frail Toronaga enters the room while Mariko, Suji, and Hiromatsu wait for him. The father then mentions as per their deal, the church tried its best to sway Lords Kiyama and Ono to Toronaga's support but failed. But Toronaga already knew that from his spies and because the church was no longer an ally to his clan, he ordered Mariko to translate for Tsuji, given that his words cannot be trusted anymore. The priest then explains in Portuguese that he was not an Ido on the church's orders, but instead came independently to alert Toronaga about Ishido's schemes. Tsuji mentions that Ishido is acting completely on Ochiba's manipulation, who in turn is doing everything for her son. Because Toronaga genuinely cares for the heir, he has the needed leverage to align with Ochiba, and given that Ishido is completely acting in his own favor, the tide would actually turn to Toronaga's side, preventing his end. Even Hiromatsu and Mariko agreed on this to be a good plan, but Toronaga insists on going ahead with his surrender after assuring Tsuji that his promise to provide the church with the land in Ido would still be honored. This prompts Hiromatsu to voice his concern about the defeated color of Toronaga's face. The Lord mentions the cost of his victory is simply too high for him to not choose a peaceful surrender. He then asks Hiromatsu to stop questioning his authority and orders him to assemble his vassals the next day in order to have their written pledge to surrender. Given that he heard rumors of soldiers in armor at his son's funeral, just when all hope seems to be lost, Toranaga requests Suji to report the truth of everything he has seen here to Osaka, without diluting the condition of Toranaga's regime. However, Hiromatsu knows his friend well enough to see this statement as a sign. The general believes this is just Toronaga's tactic to give his enemies the benefit of their doubts and in reality, his illness is probably a deception, meaning that there are still a few more tricks up the Lord's sleeve. To prevent any further dissent from being sewn into Toronaga's ranks, he decides to inform Yabushige and the other vassals that Toronaga has no intent of surrendering, insisting that their Lord won't give up without a fight. 
the tea ceremony that left us in shock. The next scene unfolds as Mariko meets Buntaro at the tea house where they compose a poem about the onset of winter. The entire tea ceremony progresses beautifully with Buntaro meticulously preparing tea for his wife, displaying great care and attention to detail that impresses her. After quietly drinking the matcha, Mariko praises Buntaro for his performance. Then the real reason behind this meeting comes to light as Buntaro mentions how they might die in Osaka by following Toronaga's plans. He reminisces about their early days of happiness together, but Mariko seems distant, not sharing the same nostalgic feelings as she struggles to recall those moments in the same light. This entire scene is a poignant moment in their already stayed marriage, especially when Buntaro asks if Mariko is still infatuated with John. When she chose not to reply, Buntaro outright suggested that they should commit a double suicide to defy Toronaga's surrender and end their suffering. Buntaro makes it seem like he is finally offering his wife the gift she always wanted, and you might even think that the worst Mariko could have said was no, but well, she did Buntaro one better. To Mariko, this proposal further reflected Buntaro's ongoing misunderstandings of her desires. She did not seek death as an escape but pursued it as a means of liberation from Buntado's mistreatment and dominance. Mariko would rather live a thousand years than choose to die with Buntado like this, especially after he suggested that they pass into oblivion together. After Mariko left the tea house for the first time, we see Buntado showing an emotion beside rage as he sobs uncontrollably. John Blackthorne is suffering from an identity crisis. That same night witnesses another striking scene of estrangement when John is led to a rundown part of Edo to seek out his men. He hears them loudly celebrating and as he approaches the door, John is completely taken off by the strong stench emanating from the place. One of his men, Salomon, is seen chasing a woman into the streets while she tries to get away from him. A disgusted John instantly regrets coming there and considers leaving but instead is spotted by Salomon who reveals that only six men remain, all of them ailing and assuming their captain had died, choosing to immerse themselves in Japan's indulgent lifestyle. He blames their condition on John's ambition, who tries to reassure Salomon that they can all leave on the Erasmus with a new crew that he has arranged. However, Salomon grows suspicious, accusing John of lying about the Spanish ships that supposedly chased them down to Japan. Salomon holds John accountable for sacrificing everyone for his own gain. When John tries to directly speak to the rest of the crew, Salomon stops him, leading to a street fight. Although John knocks him out, this altercation seemingly severs his bond with his crew, potentially cutting him off from his former life forever. John Blackthorne's next move involves an unusual alliance. With Monica's assistance, he secures a meeting with Yabushige in the hopes of reclaiming control of the Erasmus and returning to sea. With Toronaga about to surrender, Blackthorne expresses his desire to serve under Yabushige, contributing to Japan's trade under his leadership. At this point, John has no choice given that his own people made him feel like a stranger and even if he tries his best, Japan can never be a place he can call home. Sailing is apparently the only thing that calls to Blackthorn, so much so that he's willing to sail under the banner of someone he strongly dislikes, and calls a shitface. However, Yabushige declines his request and not for the reasons Blackthorn expects. Yabushige believes that Toronaga hasn't truly given up, so he prefers to wait and see what unfolds. This conversation further leads to an unexpected realization for Blackthorn who acknowledges Yabushige as a kindred, independent spirit and presents him with his katana, after feeling disconnected from his men and wanting to forge his own path. Omi strongly disagrees, considering the offer disgraceful, which prompts a flattered Yabushige to politely decline it once again. Mariko then reminds Blackthorn of the importance of loyalty within their culture, but John counters that loyalty becomes senseless when the order is suicide. Taiko's widow is dead. A muddy part of Ido has been cleared for construction as Omi stands with Kiku, who seems to be glowing with pride as Lady Jin shares her vision for the Kordesan district. While some may see it as a barren land, she envisions the future city that could flourish there. Meanwhile, Suji is being shown the location for his new church during the same time and notices the courtesans while doing so. When he inquires, he finds out that they are soon to be neighbors of his church. This situation is quite ironic given how aggressive Catholics really are. Plus, it seems like Toronaga has played his tricks to the very end. As these people prepare for a beginning, Lady Ochiba is forced to consider an end. In Osaka, Lady Dayoin, the Taiko's widow has suffered a stroke. When Achiba visits her, the Daioin requests her to end the political games, free the hostages and sever ties with Ishido in order to end the turmoil in Japan. Before her passing, Daioin insists Achiba informing their son to find her in the Pure Land, but given Achiba's expression, it is hard to say if she's gonna keep the woman's last wish.
The death we did not see coming. Back in Edo, Toronaga's commitment to surrender seems genuine, despite any of his generals doubting his decision to be a ruse. After all his vassals arrived, Toronaga mentions that each of his vassals are to sign a surrender pledge for him. Yabushige will then head to Osaka the next day to submit the names to Ishido along with the rest of the artillery. After Yabushige and Omi reluctantly signed the scroll, two of Totonaga's vassals, Sera and Tomono, voiced their objection. Although they want to stay in Edo and fight, Totonaga dismisses it given that such a move would spell disaster for Japan. The two samurais further argue with Totonaga and pleads him to embrace his Minowata lineage. Finally, General Hiromatsu joins in the disagreement, insisting that if Toronaga sticks to his decision, he would immediately commit seppuku. Now, Hiromatsu has known Toronaga since he was just a child, and is deeply disappointed to see how he is throwing away everything they have fought so hard for. So when Toronaga is still hell-bent on prioritizing Japan's well-being over anything else, Hiromatsu realizes he can't follow Toronaga anymore and chooses to commit seppuku, knowing it won't change the outcome but still uphold his honor. He places his fan and sword on the ground, bidding farewell to Toronaga with tears in his eyes, and calls his son Buntado to assist him in the ritual. When Buntado pledges to follow his father into death, Hiromatsu urges him to live on and remain loyal to Toronaga, even if it seems that their lord has given up on himself. Hiromatsu then proceeds to plunge his katana across his guts, and tearfully, Buntado fulfills his father's wish, completing the ritual as Hiromatsu's head is separated from his body right in front of Toronaga's eyes. This leaves everyone in the room absolutely floored while Toronaga is seemingly vexed by the brutal death of his one true friend. I really thought Toronaga would finally give up his ground on Hiromatsu, threatening to commit seppuku. It was easily one of the most heart-wrenching and brutal deaths in Shogun yet, and Loki me had me panicking on Toronaga's behalf. Although it feels that Hiromatsu died in vain the same night, Toronaga calls Mariko in for a meeting which clears it all. Surprisingly, there is a reason behind all the madness. Apparently, Toronaga foresaw Blackthorn seeking Yabushige's alliance after Hiromatsu's death, which he knew would remove any hesitations as they're both strategic assets, ready to be deployed against enemies. Mariko then realized that Toronaga orchestrated the Hiromatsu's apparent seppuku to deceive others into believing his surrender. Hiromatsu understood his duty and laid his life down without hesitation. But now Toronaga asked Mariko if she was ready to play her part because it was necessary that Osaka believed in his defeat. With tears in her eyes, Mariko agreed to embrace her duty, setting stage for a possible sacrifice in Toronaga's elaborate strategies in the upcoming episodes. Given how Mariko's character has been killed off in the 1980s miniseries, I really do hope they treat her character with the dignity she deserves. How does Shogun Episode 8 end? At the end of Shogun's 8th episode, we witness Osaka preparing for Lady Daioin's funeral. Meanwhile, Lady Ochiba appears to have accepted Ishido's marriage proposal in order to become a powerful couple in Japan. On the other hand, Blackthorn regains his ship through an alliance with Yabushige and are getting ready for their journey to Osaka, not to surrender but definitely for an attack or escape. Even though Omi warns Yabushige about the consequences of this alliance, Yabushige is simply relieved to not lay his life down needlessly for Toronaga. However, Mariko joins their voyage, dampening Yabushige's enthusiasm by stating her intention to ensure he surrenders on Toronaga's behalf once they are in Osaka. Meanwhile in Edo, Toronaga finally discards his facade of a sick old man and visits Nagakado's cremation site to express his gratitude. He thanks his son for earning his father the time he needed to prepare for what's coming. As the episode wraps up, Toronaga swore that the death of his friend and his son would not go to waste. It is pretty obvious at this point that Toronaga never backed down from Crimson Sky and was simply waiting for his enemies to lower their guard before striking. Although Toronaga is standing at his desired position, the upcoming two episodes will decide if the sacrifice of his son and his closest advisor was really worthwhile. I sense a lot of intense action and unexpected twists coming our way in the next two episodes, but what do you guys think? Let us know your thoughts in the comment box below. As always, if you like the content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone!